Well, welcome to week five in our series uh, in the book of James. My name is Ricky, uh, and I pastor a church in Hyde Park in the city called New Creation Church. And so I am so excited to be able to have the privilege and honor to come here today uh, around your fire pit, in your living room, wherever you are, uh, to share God's word with you. So uh, follow along on your screen in the book of James, chapter five, verse 13 through 16, and I'm going to spend the majority of my focus at the latter part of verse 16. It says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And here's our focus point. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, if there's one thing that I've learned uh, through the uh, privilege of being able to travel around the world is that the human race is more alike than we are different. I'll never forget traveling uh, to do ministry in the country of Jordan, and we went to a diner to get something to eat, and there in the balcony I could see two young people that were clearly on a date. And so, yes, I was being nosy because they were both brimming and smiling and, and, and they were hanging on each other's every word. And you could tell that they were clearly on a date. And the guy was doing this uh, phenomenon called listening. It was funny. It was something to see. And then I'll never forget uh, when I was in Honduras, uh, I noticed how hard the fathers worked there. And I could tell that the father in Honduras has the same thing on his heart and mind as the father in America. Uh, How will I provide for my family and what type of life will my children have? Then I'll never forget uh, the the level of praise and celebration and worship that they had in Dominican Republic. They really believed in celebrating. They really believed in giving God glory and honor and exerting all of the energy they possibly have in giving God praise. But what I want to bring to your attention is every people group prays. Every nationality, every ethnicity, here it is, every religion prays. So as Christian, Christians, what, what makes it different when we pray? What's so different about our prayers when we pray? If every people group prays, every religion has it in their fabric to pray, what is different about our prayers? When we pray, we join an already occurring conversation in heaven. Here's what I mean by that. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that Jesus ascended on high and he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to mankind. But what is Jesus doing in heaven? I'm glad you asked. Well, uh, contrary to popular belief, he's not actually sitting on the edge of his seat waiting for you to release your next TikTok video. Uh, uh, He's not on the ground stunting, saying, conquer death, hell, and the grave. I let you, boy. No. The Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and me. Why is that? Because Jesus, uh, being fully God and fully man, he knows exactly what we are going through right now. He stepped out of eternity into time and he lived a blameless life here on earth. He waited 30 years just to do three years of ministry, conquer death, hell, and the grave, and he understands our infirmities. He can be touched with the emotions and the trials that we experience. And so Jesus ascended back into heaven And he's making intercession for us. So when we pray as Christians, we are joining an already occurring conversation in heaven. That's why we can pray, thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. See, because Jesus came to establish 
his kingdom. So listen, uh, uh, it, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian or, or even if you're not yet a Christian, I need you to know this because prayerfully you're about to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. Prayer is literally oxygen to our bones because the Bible says that the just shall live by faith and faith cannot do what prayer has not asked. So until uh, my faith drives me to a place to pray, then it might be a great idea to do something great for humanity. It might be a great idea uh, to bring clean water to people who don't have water. It might be a great idea to eradicate racism or to eradicate homelessness, but faith cannot do what prayer has not asked until your God-given vision is saturated and soaked in prayer. It will always remain, at best, a great idea. You see... Prayer is where you literally inhale the goodness of God and exhale the burdens of life. And when we have upright hearts, James says, when we are in agreement with Jesus, our prayers have a greater outcome. So what's the problem? If the whole world agrees that we should pray, and every religion has it in the fabric of their writings or whatever they have to pray, why is it that we do so little of it? I mean, every single time a tragedy happens in our country, it is the proper lingo to say, our thoughts and prayers are with the victims of da-da-da. You know good and well they ain't praying. If prayer is so important, then why do we do so little of it? See, the problem that we face in prayer is the divide between what we experience and what we expect. If we're honest with ourselves, uh, it doesn't feel like the prayers of the righteous avail of much or are powerful and effective. If we're honest with ourselves, this statement has become more of a question to a lot of people. When we look at the pandemic we're in, we look at financial ruin, uh, we look at the domestic violence calls rising. When we look at the racial injustice and the tension in our country, and we look at uh, the, 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 the number of people that are filing unemployment claims at record rates, some of you may be wondering today, is that even true? The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective? I've got some sick people I've been praying for. I, I've got some trouble I've been praying about. And so if that has shifted from a statement to a question, here's what I want you to know today. The problem we face in prayer is the divide between what we had experienced and what we expect. Here it is. There's a story often told of a lady in New York. And she purposed in her heart to begin to pray. She said, you know what? I'm going to begin to get up at 6 a.m. and go down to the church and pray. Well, there'll be nobody there. No one will know I'm there. But I just want to press into the presence of God. And I, I, I want to go down to the church starting at 6 a.m. to pray. And she said that some mornings, the presence of God, the, the experience she had there was so impactful. It was almost though she could feel the Holy Spirit breathing on her neck. Then she said there was other mornings where nothing happened whatsoever. She didn't feel anything. She didn't notice anything. But she consistently went to the church to pray. And when they asked her, why is it that some uh, mornings you feel as though the presence of God is near and you feel as though God is answering and you are experiencing what you expect? And other days, you say that you can't even tell if there's anybody in the room. You, you don't experience anything at all. Why is it that you continue to pray when sometimes it feels as though you're the only one that's there? And she said this, and I want you to remember this. Her response was, I continue to pray because even when I don't know he's there, I know he knows I'm there. So in other words, she understands that the, righteousness, the righteous prayers of righteous people are powerful and effective. The fact that she's faithful, the fact that her heart is upright before the Lord, her righteousness before God and her faithfulness matters so much more than the emotion or anything that she feels when she prays. And so she says, 
that even when I don't know he's there, I know that he knows I'm there. You see, when we don't have answers, when we go to God in prayer and we feel like we don't leave with the answers that we desire, we always leave with assurance. That's right. I want you to know that every time that I pray, I can't tell you that I always receive the answers that I want to receive. I can't tell you that I always get the outcome. I can't tell you that I always experience what I expect. But I can tell you this. I can leave prayer. I can leave a meeting with God and leave with assurance every single time. Here it is. I can assure you that I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the words of Jesus. I can assure you that, lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Those are the words of Jesus. So friends, I want you to know something. Don't get weary in praying. Don't get bored in prayer because you may not get the answers that you're looking for. Because when we go into prayer, even when we don't leave with answers, we always leave with assurance. And so you may be asking yourself today, why is it that the prayer of a righteous person is so powerful and effective. You see, the reason a righteous person's prayer is powerful and effective is because they intentionally, intentionally draw near to the person of God. Hear me, as long as God is this big cosmic being, this mystical force that is control, controlling the strings of our lives like a puppet, then we'll be afraid of him or doubt that we can even know him personally. But when we view God as a person, when we, when we understand that our personality, that we're made in his image, where do you think he got the blueprint, pr blueprint from? He made us like him. We look like our daddy. See, they draw near to the person of God. And so since marriage symbolizes the mystical union between Christ and, the, and his bride, the church. I want to use marriage uh, as an analogy or illustration to give you three elements of prayer that I believe can set our prayer lives in a place that it will be effective and powerful. First, desire. That is to know his heart. The Bible says that they that hunger and thirst after righteousness they shall be filled. And so a person who has as their greatest desire to know the heart of God. See, a lot of times prayer, especially in the Western Americanized version, it could really be our giving God our order. Does your prayer sound more like a person that's getting to know the heart of God or a person that's reading a menu to a waitress? You see, when we, when we pray in a way that, that, that our desires are directed toward him to know his heart, the Bible says when we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we shall be filled. I'll never forget uh, dating my wife. Um, before we met in person, uh, we uh, talked on the phone a whole lot. And now, today's generation, you're intimate then you start dating, then you start talking on the phone, but hey, we did it the old fashioned way. We, we started talking on the phone and then we began to date and then we got married and then all of that other stuff. But listen, we began to talk on the phone and unbeknownst to her, I kept by the phone just a pad and I would write down her favorite dessert and I would write down her favorite color. And then I would keep talking to her and I would write down that she likes to bowl. And then I will write down uh, some of her experiences and how she grew up and who she was closest with in her family. I will write these things down. Why? Because I was being intentional. I had a desire to know her heart. Friends, I'm telling you, when you approach God with the desire to know him, you draw near to the person of God, your prayers will be powerful and effective. Next, we've got to decide. Don't ever leave. Here's what I mean. Our friend who would go to the church in New York, she made the conscious decision to keep praying and to keep seeking no matter what her emotional experience was. 
I can tell you right now, uh, I'm a pastor of a church. Uh, I started preaching in 2003, and I'm going to tell you right now, I don't always get goosebumps. I don't always feel something when I pray, but I have to press in to get instructions from heaven. I have to, because prayer is oxygen for the believer. It is literally oxygen to our bones because the just shall live by faith, and faith cannot do what prayer has not asked. You see, uh, I'll never forget, we almost didn't get married because we were about to break up. And the only thing that was going to cause us to break up was pride. I'll never forget, uh, I had been out of town and I called her up, you know, and I asked her, I don't know, it was sort of a dumb question. I had the nerve to ask her, so did you miss me while I was gone? And she said, no. And that hurt my ego so bad. But she was just being honest with me. She said, you haven't been gone long enough for me to miss you yet. We've only been dating a month. I had already decided when I met her profile on eHarmony, I'm marrying that woman. So I was sold. And and so I said, you know what? Uh, That's hurtful and that's painful. And then we started to have some, some, some strife because I had a bruised ego. But I'm telling you right now, you've got to make a decision that even when the emotions are not where you want them to be, even when you don't experience what you expect, you've got to make a decision. Don't ever leave. And I'm so glad today, I'm telling you, uh, we dated for a short period of six months and we were at the altar six months later. And I'm so glad I decided not to leave. Don't ever leave the threshing floor of prayer. Finally, the reason why a righteous person's prayer is powerful and effective is because they have learned that they have to detach. You've got to let it go. You see, you can't hear the voice of God and hear the voice of the world at the same time. You cannot be filled if you're already full. So my wife and I, we went from dating to being engaged and Once we got engaged, I realized something right away, uh, that I was going to live my life very different as a married man than I did when I was single. And there were certain things that would pop up on my timeline with people I I was friends with that were single, certain outfits, uh, like they're trying to break the internet or something, get as much uh, likes as they could possibly get. And you know what I did? I didn't unfriend them, but I unfollowed every single one of those people that were habitually posting things that would cause my attention to go where it didn't need to go. So I made a, a decision. It's like, okay, I'm getting married. This is, I'm going to be faithful to my wife, and I don't need the distractions. I made a decision to detach. I want to challenge you right now where you are. Uh, you can say, I can quit anytime, but why don't you quit today? See, part of the reason why a righteous person's prayer is powerful and effective is because they are willing to detach. So when we desire to know his heart, when we decide to enter into his presence, we, when we decide to detach from the world, our prayers are powerful and effective. I can't think of a quote more appropriate than the one from Karl Barth when we look at the disorder that the world is in right now. And he says, to clasp the hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder in the world. Friends, a world at its worst needs the church at its best. So my question today is simply this, will you, will you uh, desire to actually know the heart of God? Will you decide to press in and enter in and seek him in prayer no matter if you don't experience what you expect? And will you detach from the things that cause us to be distracted? Uh, Speaking of disorder, there's a story uh, that's told about uh, two young boys that had a habit of taking their bicycle apart in the driveway. 
And oh man, you should see it. You would come uh, to the driveway and you would see uh, handlebars over here. You would see pedals over there and there was a, a wheels over here and the chain was in another spot. And for fun, they would just get a wrench and they would just take their bike apart and there was a bunch of, well, disorder. The only problem is they didn't have a clue as to how to put the bike back together again, but they never feared and they never worried, not once. Here's why. It's because they knew that around 5, 5.30, if they looked down the street, they would see the father coming home and he would come into the driveway and the father would step out of his car and he would look at the wreckage before him. He would look at the pieces of the bike everywhere laid all over the driveway. And the difference between the father and the children is this, the father know how to put it back together again. So this then is our confidence and our strength when we pray. We are praying to the Father in heaven and He knows how to put together the broken pieces of our life. If you have a broken marriage, I want you to know the Father can put it back together again. If you got broken finances, I want you to know that the Father knows how to put it back together again. If you got broken relationships with your children, the Father knows how to put us back together again. If you're watching and you want to take the next step with Jesus, you're watching this at a watch party in the driveway with your friends, or there's someone there from Mission Church, they may not have all the answers, but they know how to tell you what to do in order to begin a relationship with Jesus. And if you're watching online, you can just pray this simple prayer right there in the comment section, Jesus saved me. And if you would, just pray with me right now these simple words. Sorry, thank you, please. God, I'm sorry for the things that I've done. Thank you for dying in my place on the cross. Please be Lord over my life and lead me for the rest of my life. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen.
Yeah.